Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyana Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam amma ba'd habatu fillah Continue on in our study. Uh, we reached the second criterion for hajjim that the Shaykh mentioned. The second criterion for boycotting, for cutting someone, uh, someone off and when this is legislated in the religion. And this is still with the sixth point in the, uh, amongst the general points of uh, Ahl Sunnah of giving advice to Ahl Sunnah. So he said the second, meaning the second duwabit or the second criterion pertaining to the mahjur, meaning the one being boycotted. So I think we, we have a good idea, but the one being boycotted is the one you are cutting off. He said boycotting him is admissible if it is anticipated that he will be affected by the boycott and eventually return to the truth. But if he doesn't benefit from the boycott, then it could push him further away and increase him in his rebellion, at which point it is not recommended legislat legislatively to boycott him. This is due to the fact that some people have a natural disposition of stubbornness, rebellion, and a lack of humility to the truth even at the expense of his destruction. Individuals like this will not benefit from the discipline of boycotting. Instead, it is possible that he will benefit more from leniency. Perhaps many of those who don't benefit from being boycotted is due to some external affairs like the fact that he is wealthy or someone of status and leadership. Generally, these types of people do not benefit from Hajar because... They deem themselves self-sufficient from the one who is applying the boycott initially. And as a result of this, the Prophet ﷺ used to apply leniency to the leaders who were followed and obeyed to their subjects, as well as the people of status like Abu Sufyan, uh, Uyayna ibn Husn, and Al-Aqra ibn Habis, radiallahu ta'ala anhum. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah said in this regard, and because of this, the Prophet wasallam used to employ leniency and gentleness with some people and boycott others. Like the three who remained behind from the Battle of Tabuk, these companions were better by far than those whom the Prophet used to be gentle with. In order to bring their hearts closer to Islam, due to the fact that they were the leaders and the most respected amongst their people, meaning that the Prophet wasallam, those companions uh, like Kaab bin Malik and others, he was, he, you know, he boycotted them. And that had a big effect upon them for something that you would think would almost be more minor. And the other hand, others who were uh, big leaders and they had a lot of people, you know, behind them, that there wasn't the same, the Prophet ﷺ was lenient with them, meaning that the, the maslaha wasn't there, that it would have been necessarily benefit to cut them off because they were already stubborn and people who had um, status and respect. So they felt they didn't need uh, uh, the Prophet ﷺ. And if the Prophet ﷺ had cut them off, perhaps it would have made them transgress even further and not embrace Islam. And so the point being is being able to distinguish uh, and look and have an fiqh to where you can understand and be able to look at an issue, at least based on knowledge, at least based on some criteria, some bawabit, at least based upon some fiqh and understanding. So that way you can, if you are ahlan for this, if you have the, the background for this, the knowledge and the prerequisite, then you can look at the masada and the mufasid. You can look at the harms and the benefits of doing so. You can look at each individual. And I can think of countless examples, and I'm going to try to rattle off a few uh, very quickly. One example that I recall that we lived through was a time, maybe some of you may not know a sheikh, his name was Sheikh Fale al-Harbi. And at that time, unfortunately, a lot of the brothers were very uh, misguided, and they had a lot of ta'asib towards him. You know, and if you go, a lot of those websites, they've erased what they used to say, but they used to translate and translate many mistakes that were coming from this uh, individual's mouth. And 
they were blind following. And I recall even way back when I first heard him, I, I just wasn't that kind of personality, cult of personality person to necessarily just blind follow. Okay. And the people used to make such ta'zim of, of him. And this caused many people to go astray. And then when him and Sheikh Rabi, they finally, Sheikh Rabi uh, advised him and then the advice had went public and then it just got ugly between them. And the point being that that did not, you know, he took off many and affected many communities and took out many people of Salafia. And many of the scholars in Medina were affected at the time. And, and the youth were affected. They left the circles of many Mashaikh that now the, the same people are translating for and quoting from. Some of those Mashaikh, they, 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 um, uh, the people had abandoned. Okay. And so what we see, we saw the, the harms there, but the, the Shahid being the, the main point of mentioning this is that he persisted. He, you know, for one, he's a Bedouin. Okay. And the Bedouins, and what I've noticed amongst the Arabs, and this is not a thing of necessary racism, but it's a, a trait that many of them have, especially those who have uh, very strong tribal backgrounds. They're very stubborn. And that will come if it doesn't matter if they're African or Arab or Afghani, or especially those very tribal societies. A lot of times it's very hard for them to uh, not just accept the truth, but to go, you know, to back down. You know, they have a very strong disposition and which can be border if they're if they're ignorant ones then they it borders on arrogance or it is arrogance a lot of times. So it's very hard for them to come away from a point, even if it goes against the hawk, they will stay in stern because they're faced. So in, it appears in his scenario that he couldn't after all the Mashaikh finally abandoned him and criticized him after Sheikh Rabi extensively refuted him uh, and some of his principles. Then finally, some of the youth, they left him and so on and so forth. But he still persisted. Even to this day, you know, he has whatever his small study circle or, you know, whoever follows him. And there's still a group of people who, who take knowledge from him and go with what he says. Okay. And that shows that extreme, uh, that, that arrogance and where the Hajjr may or may not, Wallahu uh, Alam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best, how the benefit of that. Perhaps that was beneficial that the people cut him off because then a lot of the youth, they came back away from some of his principles. But we still see that a lot of times people shift from one blind following of an individual to blind following someone else or another couple of uh, individuals. So this is, uh, unfortunately, there's many people who don't learn. But there's a lesson for those whose eyes are open and that, you know, you know, we're ordered to follow the, the haq. We're ordered to follow the truth. La yuraf al-haq birijal wa lakin yuraf al-rijal bil-haq wa kama il. That one of the great imams, I believe it was Imam Malik, he said that we don't know the truth by men, but we know the men by truth. Meaning that we don't judge the truth in according with what, Sheikh so and so says, if it was Sheikh Rabi, if it was Sheikh Yahya al Hujuri, if it was Sheikh Abdul Masan al Abad, it was Sheikh whoever, we don't make the truth is not based upon what they say, but the truth is the truth. And we judge them by the truth. We put their statements on the scale of the book in the Sunnah. And so that's, that's the important qaida that we can benefit from that. And so, going back to the topic of Hajr, that sometimes the Hajr can cause someone to go even further into transgression. And uh, that is not the maqsad of the hajr. Another example that I want to give that uh, personally that I witnessed uh, in Yemen from a long time ago when the fitna of another scholar who is, who is known, who, who deviated, uh, Mubtadi'a, named uh, Sheikh Abu Hassan al-Ma'rabi, okay? And Sheikh Rabi is also extensively written, and many Mashayikh have clarified uh, a lot of his errors. And, uh, you know, and he's fought in his own ways too, because, and, and, and fought against uh, the criticisms of him. But the point being is 
what it how it affected many communities, especially in places like Yemen, because he still lives in Yemen. And I recall an individual that I love dearly who was still holding on way back then when the fitna first broke out and all of the youth, all of his companions, and he was the most knowledgeable of them. I used to learn from him some fiqh and, and other benefit. He is my beloved companion and I still love him to this day. I hope he's still alive in Yemen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless him. I mean him and his family. I mean Ya Rabbil Alameen, a beloved, beloved companion of mine. But anyhow, me, especially at that time, I didn't have a lot of knowledge, but I was with, you know, majority of Ahl Sunnah who was against uh, Abu Hassan. So it wasn't based on necessarily knowledge, but that's, you know, it was more taqlid, you know, that's Sheikh Rabi said this, and he's written extensively, and I'm with that. And all the youth were on that too, not necessarily based on ilm, but he was looking at the issues from an ilmi perspective, and he was on it, but all the brothers cut him off. But it didn't, it didn't affect him because they needed him more than he needed him and needed them because he had more knowledge. But, you know, it really kind of saddened me because we were all companions, you know, when I lived in Yemen at that time in Aden and those guys were my beloved brothers and I love them all and may Allah preserve them all. And my point being for mentioning this Hajar is that it didn't necessarily change his view. And I don't know if he changed his view over the years, but I didn't see any benefit and didn't have the knowledge and didn't have the shaksiyah, even the, the my heart he just couldn't uh, just cut him off because he was the most beloved and the most accepted, accepting from amongst them. You know, he took care of me. And uh, again, we would always debate about the issue and talk about it and uh, and so on and so forth. And he wasn't a blind following fanatic. So there was no necessarily benefit in making hajjah. And so the point is, is going back to the Dawabit, as you're looking at the Masada and you're looking at the Mufasid. And people's position, if they're a person, for example, another issue I see, which has been a mistake in many of our communities in America specifically, and probably in the West in general, is some of the elders that put in a lot of work and a lot of us benefited from as youth and learning something about Islam, they had many mistakes. They didn't know. They weren't on the path of the Salaf al-Saleh. You know, they had some influences from Akhwan and Muslimin, even they didn't know it. You know, that they were uh, affected by many menahids because they weren't necessarily students of knowledge and the knowledge, the exposure just wasn't there. But they were big elders who are respected around the world. And so you saw some of the youth, when they study just a little bit, they go away for a couple of years, they come back, then they're instantly boycotting and causing fitna in the communities of these great imams, great imams in their stature and their, in their respect around the world, in them being elders and the wisdom of knowing how to deal with things. Those, some of those individuals, they changed whole communities from gangsters and, and, and blood spilling and came even with the Quran in their hand and changed whole communities, told the gangbangers, you guys got 24 hours, you're out of here, and we're taking over this area. And if you want to go further than that, we're coming for your heads. Okay, they established a lot of those communities on blood. They established those communities, and they are a, 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 a stepping stone for us. You know, we were able, some of us, to go and study and learn more. But how do you, if you were to use wisdom, which some of the students are using, and fiqh, and that's what you're supposed to learn from going and studying, you go back and you, how do you deal with those elders? Do you make, do you boycott someone who has way more status? You're unknown. You're just coming and they just say, oh, those Salafis are causing fitna. No, instead you need to deal with those elders in a way that you can benefit from their experience and where they can accept you and you can influence them with, and their communities with khair. That's the maslaha. That's the greater benefit. That's a greater benefit than you thinking that you can prove something through your hajr and it being a personal thing, but instead these things have the wabit. So there's a certain way you've got to deal with it. So it would be better to deal with them with leniency. And this, we still see the problem. Look how many of our du'at now are being criticized, uh, and I can only speak more so in the, in the American context, even though I'm not there, but just what I see and people who criticize me or, 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 or comment and stuff like this, why Tahir, uh, Mufti, you know, uh, you know, other brothers who are out there doing da'wah, a lot of the brothers in the Muslim Family Center and all those brothers who are doing some khair, 
uh, Sajid, uh, you know, all those brothers who are in the East Coast who are doing some good work there, raising up their communities, Ali Davis and others. And what you see, these people are applying principles. They're actually going back to those books, what they were trained to do and study. But you have other individuals who criticize and attack them and say, you're going to Ahl al You're teaching Ahl al You're the Imam Ahl al Subhanallah, instead of looking at these Dawabit and criterion, that perhaps leniency has more benefit. Number two, that Allah has favored them to be in positions of Ta'lim, where they are the teachers of community. Sometimes you may be teaching Ahl al Sometimes you may be teaching the general Muslims who don't know. And that's the point. That's what da'wah is, propagation. You're propagating Islam. You're propagating the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You are representing that, and you're supposed to set an example. You're supposed to bring about the maslaha. So if there is good in that, then how is it you can criticize and attack and say, he's teaching with Ahl al I saw him sitting with Ahl al He's at a conference with Ahl al He's the, you know... So this is why it's very important to have some dawabit and criterion. Then you can look at those issues with more ilm and basira bi'idn Allah ta'ala. The third criterion, and we're going to go through this part quick since I took up a lot of time. He said the third, and this is talking, remember, these are criterion of hajjah. So this is still under the sixth point in his advice. The third, pertaining to the type of infringement that necessitates hajjah. Okay, so now this is talking about when you're looking at Hajar, you're also looking at the type of sin or the type of, of mukhalifa that is uh, that necessitates Hajar. Okay, so not all things that someone does, oh, Hajar, let's, let's clean it up. Let's clean up his, his thing. We saw him use a bad word. Let's make Hajar of him. No, there are certain uh, uh, sins and certain infringements, if you will, that may require Hajar and, may, and others that do not. He said, there is no act of disobedience or opposition in Islam that is safe to say absolutely that anyone who does it deserves to be boycotted or that he doesn't deserve to be boycotted. So that's very, he explains it very clear there. Just as some believe that they should boycott every innovation and not the acts of disobedience, disobedience to Allah. So some people say, if, he's a, if it's bid'ah, we boycott. If it's a sin, we don't boycott. That's what some people say. Or they boycott the bid'ah, bid'ah mukaffara, you know, the bid'ah which takes you out of the fold of Islam without boycotting the other types of innovation. Or they boycott the major sins instead of the minor ones. So, you know, different people are applying things differently instead of looking at some general principles and criterion that are come, coming from the, uh, deduced from the book and the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the salaf as so he said, boycotting is legislated for every type of opposition and every act of disobedience, whether major or minor, as long as it is expected that the one being boycotted will benefit from it. So that means that there's there's maslaha. So again, it's going back, and that's why I said the malachis, the easiest way to understand all these issues is knowing, is looking at the harms and benefits. And if you have the ability to be able to weigh based on knowledge and fiqh, then you can look at these harms and benefits and you can see, you can look at it from the different ways of perspective, the different perspectives as we're talking about and, and going through right now from the Sheikh's uh, treaties. So he said, uh, so he says, so determining the, the, so the determining factor in this issue is to, is centered around the benefit of the one being boycotted and the lack thereof without looking at the degree or grade of opposition or infraction. Based upon this, a virtuous man can be boycotted because of a minor sin or a minor infringement of the sunnah. Just as the Prophet ﷺ boycotted some of his companions due to some minor infractions they committed. For example, he did not return the greeting of peace, return the salam to Amar ibn Yasir because he was wearing yellow and he boycotted the one who built a dome until he knocked it down. At the same time, Hajr could be avoided altogether due to some major infractions by those who are less virtuous than those who were boycotted from the Sahaba An example of this is found in the leniency and gentleness of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi with Al-Aqra ibn Habis and Uyayna ibn Husn radiallahu ta'ala Rather, he was even lenient with some of the Munafiqun, like Abdullah ibn Ubayd and others, 
all of this is viewed in light of the benefit that will result from boycotting and the lack thereof, along with careful consideration of the other guidelines pertinent to the issue of boycotting. And we ask Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil. Anything I said that was correct was from Allah Azza wa Jal. Anything I said that was incorrect was for myself and the shaitan. And in the next sitting, we'll continue to talk about some of those dhuabit, the further, the fourth and the fifth uh, dhuabit or dhuabit of Hajar. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad.